Father, we come before you, Lord, and we do thank you for the privilege of serving you. And we know as born-again believers that you desire us to take in the Word of God consistently. And we pray that we might continue to take in your Word by faith. And as we grow in your grace, may we give honor and glory to you in all things. I pray this morning that uh, the believers here might concentrate on the teaching of the Word and sanctify the believers through your truth, because your word is truth. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. If you have your Bibles, let's turn to the passage in John chapter 5, verse 15. The last few weeks, we've been studying the healing of this lame man at the pool of Bethesda, And this individual, verse 5, was... Uh, had an infirmity of over 38 years. He was this way for 38 years. Um, and Jesus came along and healed this individual. In verse 8, he told him to rise, take up your bed, and walk. And we know that this caused a controversy among the Jews because Jesus commanded him to take up his bed, and that was the Sabbath day. Now, Keep in mind that the Pharisees added extra biblical regulations concerning the Sabbath. The man did not violate the Sabbath by carrying his bed. That was not a violation of the Sabbath command. But the Jews accused him of doing so, and they accused Jesus of promoting Sabbath breaking. They could not rejoice that this man was healed after 38 years. Uh, they had to focus on the violation of the Sabbath regulation in their mind. So this controversy uh, played itself out here. And um, you would think, though, at this point, that this man who was healed would believe that Jesus is the Messiah. But as we read down through this passage, there is no evidence at all of this man's faith as far as uh, uh, his statement of knowing who Christ is. There's none, at, none whatsoever. As a matter of fact, when the question was asked, who made you well, uh, he indicates, uh, um, notice here, um, that it was um, Jesus, but he really didn't understand who he was. He really didn't understand who he was. Now, I, having said that here, I want to point out in verse 15 that what this man do, did after he was healed immediately was to report to the Jews that it was Jesus who made him well. Now, at first glance, that might seem that he's giving his testimony of this healing. He wants to tell people about what Jesus did, but this should be seen in a negative light, not in a positive light, what he did. And uh, we know that this is in a negative light because of the word translated told. He told the Jews that it was Jesus. The word told is a strong one in this context. It almost equals announced. What seems to be implied is that the man wished to ingratiate himself with the leadership by giving them the information they wanted. The writer of this gospel, of course, undoubtedly knew of many people who had seen the spiritual power of Jesus' word, but still wished to stay on the good side of Jewish law. Why would he have to run to the Jews? We know that the Jews were hostile toward Jesus. But he went to that very hostile crowd and reported what had occurred. So it seems to say that this man was not really giving his testimony about who Jesus was and what he did, but was still simply reporting on Jesus. Now, verse, uh, verse 16, for this reason the Jews persecuted Jesus. Notice that. So as a result of this report, the Jews decided to persecute Jesus and they sought to kill him because he had done these things on the Sabbath day. So again, they were not glad that this man was healed. They did not see this miracle as validating who Jesus was. They simply wanted to get rid of Jesus. And uh, certainly they were controlled by satanic hatred toward the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. It's interesting, there are other individuals in the scripture who came to faith in Christ uh, because of healings but, uh, and miracles, but these ones, individual Jews, were not persuaded by the miracles. Now, think about the desire to kill Christ. And murder 
is far worse than a Sabbath violation. Think about the two <laughs> commands. <laughs> Uh, they're claiming he violated the command not to keep the Sabbath, right? The fourth command. But we have the sixth command, thou shall not kill. And that means premeditated murder. And so it's interesting that they kind of uh, attack his so-called Sabbath violation, but then they want in turn to murder him. <laughs> That's just amazing how people can, gl can gloss over their own sin when, putting, when pointing to the sins of others. They completely ignore this. Now, you could probably excuse this in one sense of saying that, well, they're claiming that Jesus committed blasphemy and therefore they want to stone him because of Sabbath violations. That could be read into the text, but certainly I think the motive of murder is wrong in either case. They sought actually to murder him uh, because he violated the Sabbath day. Now, let's take a look at a couple verses along those lines. Matthew 23, verse 23. Jesus rebukes the Pharisees in this chapter, and we have a series of woes. I think we have and haven't counted him, but we have several times the word woe is used here in regard to the Pharisees. It's a picture of judgment, uh, that word. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! You pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin. These are spices. You know, they tithe by the amount of spices they have, a certain percentage. Uh, they have neglected, though, the weightier matters of the law. They skip over the big issues concerning the law, justice, mercy, and faith. Think about that. They skip over the big issues of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. These ought to have done without leaving the others undone. So one thing about the Pharisees is they ignored the important issues of the law and they focused on the details. They majored on the minors and minored on the majors. So they majored on the minors and minored on the majors. That's a characteristic of legalism. They'll focus on one minute violation, skip over, you know, loving others and skipping over, you know, mercy and uh that's certainly what they did in this man's case. They focused on the violation of Sabbath, taking up your bed. They want to accuse him. They want to accuse Jesus, not God showing mercy by healing this man on the Sabbath. They skipped over that. Uh, Luke chapter 11, verse 42. Luke chapter 11, verse 42. Well, to Pharisees, a similar passage here, uh, but notice what is added in this parallel account is love. Well, to you Pharisees, for you tithe mint and rue and all manner of herbs and pass by justice and the love of God. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. So again, um, they pass over compassion, mercy, and love for, for one another. And therefore, they were completely in the wrong. Now, Jesus defends what he did because he demonstrates that he is deity in several different ways. He is simply following the Father's orders. And he has his close, intimate relationship with the Father, being the Son of God. Uh, he indicated that my Father has been working until now, and I am working. I'm just imitating my father's commands. I'm doing what my father wants me to do uh, in healing this man. This is what God wants. God wanted this miracle, even if it was a Sabbath day. Uh, God wanted this to be done. And notice he did not say, our father. You know, Jesus taught his disciples how to pray, our father who art in heaven. He's here, he's saying, my father. And I think this contrast here places him on a level of deity, he did not place himself on a level with the Jews or with men. He didn't say, our father, I'm doing what our father wants us to do. He says, I'm doing what my father wants me to do. So again, this is a, shows that Jesus had a unique relationship to the father that those Jews did not. Since God continually does good works without allowing himself to stop on the Sabbath, the son does likewise. Since Jewish tradition recognizes that God worked even on the Sabbath, sustaining creation. Think about what occurs on the Sabbath day. Babies are born on the Sabbath day. 
The universe still continues. And by the way, who sustains the universe? The Lord Jesus Christ. He upholds all things by the word of his omnipotent power, Colossians chapter 1. Uh, therefore, God continues to operate on the Sabbath day. He did stop his creative work on the Sabbath day, but God still does things on the Sabbath day, such as sustaining creation and bringing life into the world. Now, this phrase, my father's been working until now and I have been working, implied that he, like the father, who is a creator redeemer, is the source of all life and salvation. He is the source of life. He can give physical life and also eternal life. And therefore, he's showing himself as the sustainer of life. And uh, therefore, healing this man showed that he was deity. Now, the Jews, in verse 18, sought all the more to kill him because he not only broke the Sabbath, but he said that God was his father. So now they have another reason for killing Jesus in their minds. He broke the Sabbath, he deserved to die, and now he's claiming that God is his father, making himself equal with God. I've always said this, I, I think theologians ask, where in the scripture did Jesus ever claim to be God? It's all the way through the word of God. Now, I had one, I mentioned this before, I had one friend of mine who attended seminary who said the scriptures nowhere declares that Jesus never declared that he was God. I'm thinking, really? Uh, does he have to say the words, I am God? Uh, he does things, he uses names of God, he does the works of God. All the way through this chapter, we'll see his claim for deity. Uh, and the Jews understood this. Well, he said, seminary students do not understand this, but the Jews understood this is a claim of deity. Uh, he certainly was equal with God. That statement that he referred to God as his father personally was a claim of equality with God. It was a claim of deity. And the Jews at least got that right. <laughs> they got that much right. Um, and therefore, that was a motivation, blasphemy. You're claiming to be God. You're claiming, you're claiming you're on the same level as God. Yes, that's exactly right. That's what he's claiming. The Jews at once grasped the meaning that Jesus declares God to be his father in the sense which no other man can call God father. An example that in his person as the son, he is equal with the father. He's on the same level. He has the same attributes as the father does. Now, refresh your course on the Trinity. There are three persons in the Godhead that are distinct. We do not confuse the fact that Jesus Christ is God the Father. Okay, we have the God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. There's not three separate gods, but one God. The persons in the Trinity are distinct. Some people confuse us. Some Pentecostals, uh, you know, thought that Christ, or the Father, became the Son. They teach that, and the Father never became the Son. The Father was separate from the Son, but they're one in essence. So when we speak about one God and three persons, we're talking about the attributes of God. There's only one God, but the persons are distinct and separate. That's the biblical doctrine of the Trinity. And so he is claiming having the same essence with the Father, the same attributes as the Father. That was his claim by saying God is his Father. Christ is equal to the Father in that he possesses deity, the very essence of the Godhead. As a matter of fact, in John chapter 10, verse 30, he made this statement, I and my Father are one. What's that? I and my Father are one. Now notice the following verse here. Same reaction from the Jews. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered, many good works I've shown you from my Father. For which of these works do you stone me? <laughs> Which are the good things that I've done do you stone me for? And Jesus said, the Jews answered him, verse 33, saying, For a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy. And because you being a man, make yourself God. Think about that. So Jesus certainly was one in essence with the Father. He did not rebuke them for that understanding. 
You remember what he told Thomas after the resurrection? When Thomas said, when, or what Thomas said, he, Thomas said to Jesus, my Lord and my God, my God. He understood Christ's deity. And the resurrection proved his victory over death and the deity of Christ. My Lord and my God, I've always stated this, so how do uh, people who deny the deity of Christ get around that passage? Well, Jehovah's Witness, they say that, well, he was simply swearing, my God. You don't find, no, no, that's ridiculous. It's a very strong affirmation of his deity. He wasn't swearing, my God, when he saw Christ. Thomas didn't do that. He understood that Jesus Christ was who he claimed to be. Uh, so many passages in the scriptures point to the deity of Christ. We could go through the book of John and notice the I am statements. Um, I am the Father, I and my Father are one. That was the one we read in John chapter 10. Uh, John 8, 58, before Abraham was, I am. Not before Abraham existed. He says before Abraham came into being, I eternally exist. We can translate those phrases. We have that contrast between the two verbs there. Before Abraham came into being, I, a me, eternally exists. We have genomine, a me in the Greek. We have that contrast used in John chapter 1. So the earth came into being, but the logos did not. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. In verse 3 in John chapter 1, the creation, genomine, came into being, but Jesus Christ did not. But he did take on human nature in John 1.14. Humanity was added to deity. So the incarnation is not a subtraction, it's an addition. <laughs> His deity wasn't given up when he took on human nature. It was an addition. He added humanity to his deity, and he never did give up deity. For Jesus Christ ever to take away, for instance, if Jesus Christ ever gave up any attribute of deity, he would cease to be God. But he did not. Even in his humanity, he claimed equality with God. Think about that. Even as a human being, he's claiming equality with God. So this shows you that Jesus did not give up any attribute of deity when he came on and took on human flesh. Now, did Jesus really make himself equal with God? Here he claims equality in seven points. And the answer is yes, uh, this text clearly does show you that claim. And we will see in verse 19, he is equal in working. You know, my father's working and I am. He's equal in working with the father, doing the father's will. Uh, secondly, equal in knowing in verse 20. We'll see thirdly, equality in resurrecting. He has a prerogative of resurrecting in verses 21, 28, and 29. He will judge all of humanity one day, equality in judging, in verses 22 and 27. Equality and honor, equality and honor, in verse 23. Equality in regenerating, in verses 24 and 25. And the equality and self-existence in verse 26. And I'll just leave those up there. We're going to just read those passages just briefly. We'll go into greater detail later. But this whole section really is a strong affirmation of Christ's equality with the Father. It's a strong affirmation of the deity of Christ. So in verse 19, let's look at our text in John 10. Um excuse me, not John 10, uh, John uh, chapter 5, John 5, verse 19. Then Jesus answered and said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself, but what he sees the Father do, for whatever he does, the Son also does in like manner. He does exactly what the Father wants him to do. He's equal in working. He's equal in knowing. For as the Father loves the Son and shows him all things that he himself does, he will show him greater works than these that you may marvel. The Father reveals his complete purpose and plan to the Son, so he knows everything as far as the Father's will. He's equal in resurrecting, verse 21. As the Father raises the dead and gives life to them, even so the Son gives life to whomever he will. He's the giver of life. And we'll see that that means 
not only eternal life, but that is resurrect, resurrection life. He is the author of life. That cannot be stated of any human being. Um, you know, we, sometimes you have parents that are arrogant and they tell their children when they're acting up, well, I gave you life. No, you did not give them life. You might have birthed them as a mother, but you did not give that child life. God is the author of life. Life and death are in the hands of God. And therefore, the Lord Jesus Christ is the author of life. He's the one who can give life, not only physical life, but eternal life. Then we have the equal quality in judging. Uh, verse 22, for the father judges no one, but committed all judgment to the son, that he, that all should honor the son just as they honor the father. Equal honor. Think, think about that. Equal judgment, equality, and honor. He who does not honor the son does not honor the father who sent him. So there are Jews who do not believe that Jesus is the son of God. They do not believe in the deity of Christ. They are dishonoring their father. You ever think about that? Uh, if you don't honor Christ and recognize who he is, then you are rejecting what God said about his son. Not only in the New Testament, but in the Old Testament as well. This is my beloved son. And uh, so we have uh, the acknowledgement of the distinction between the father and the son, even in the Old Testament. So you disrespect what the father said about the Messiah, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. So we have equality in judging, equality in honor, equality in regenerating. And I love this passage. We're quickly approaching an exposition of verse 24. Most assuredly I say to you, he who hears my words and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life currently. I've always stated, you don't have to wait till you die to have that assurance of eternal life. Eternal life is given at the moment of new birth. You have it now. Not when I die, I have life now eternal life now. Um, and by the way, future, I will not come into judgment. In the future, I will not ever come into judgment. I'll never be condemned eternally in the lake of fire once, I've, once I have believed. I will not in the future come into judgment. But, of always, but I have passed from death to life. I pass out of a state of spiritual death, Ephesians 2, 1, separated from a holy God, into now a state of spiritual life. So that's a tremendous affirmation of our eternal security. But he's equal and regenerating. And verse uh, 25, most assuredly I say to you that hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. We certainly know the dead in Christ will rise first. The Lord will come with a what? Shout. So there'll be, you know, in, the question is, at the rapture, what will the Lord Jesus Christ say to the dead? And you remember what he told Lazarus at the tomb, Lazarus, arise, John 11. And uh, if he said, arise, everyone would have came out of the grave. <laughs> but he might say, those in Christ, arise and give the command. I don't know exactly, the scripture doesn't say what he will shout with, what, what, how he will command but it's something to that extent that believers will come out of their graves, those who are dead in Christ. So one day they'll hear the voice of the Son of God in resurrection. No ordinary human being can do that. I don't see how you can miss over the de miss and skip over the deity of Christ by reading God's Gospel of John. It's all the way through the Gospel of John. Christ is God. Very, very clear. And then equality and self-existence, verse 26, for as the Father has life in himself. And by the way, we are receivers of life. We don't have inherent life. There's a difference. We are receivers of life from God, but we do not have life inherently. Only deity does. That's one, one attribute of God, self-existence. Uh, the Father has self-existence. He has life in himself. A son has self-existence. Uh, we are life receivers. He is a life giver. That's why only Christ can give eternal life. I cannot give you eternal life. Uh, only Christ can give you eternal life because he has life inherently, just as the Father does. As the Father has life in himself, 
so he's granted the Son to have life in himself. Both the Father and the Son are equal in self-existence. Let's take a look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and we'll just make a brief contrast between Adam and Christ. And notice here um, in verse 21, and uh, we'll look uh, at uh, verse 21, 22. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. Now, who was that man that brought death to the human race? Adam. All sinned in Adam, and death passed upon all, Romans 5, 12. Um, who is the one who gives resurrection life? The Lord Jesus Christ. He is the second Adam in that sense. Verse 22, as in Adam all die, there is positional truth for the unsaved. Now, we went through positional truth, the 50 things that God has given to the believer who is in Christ, the moment of faith alone, Christ alone, but what about the unbeliever? You're either connected to one or two, one of two people. You're either in Adam or in Christ, in the church age. I'm either in Adam, as an unsaved person, I'm connected to Adam experiencing spiritual death, eventually physical death, thirdly, eternal death, separated from a holy God. Or I can believe in Christ and have life, everlasting life, and then resurrection life as well. As in Adam all die, even so in Christ, those who are in union with Christ shall be made alive. And that includes the resurrection, certainly pictures the resurrection and that will occur in the order of resurrections as stated in the following verses. But we know that Adam was a life receiver. Notice, let's skip forward to verse 45. As it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. We know back in the book of Genesis, God breathed into man's nostril the breath of lives, plural. And man became a living being. Adam was a life receiver. Notice the last Adam became a life life giving spirit. Now we can so we can translate verse forty five. Adam was a life receiver. The last Adam is a life giver. Okay, Adam received life from God. Christ gives life, and there's an important distinction. So Christ is equal with God in every sense of the word. He is deity. Now. Let's look at verse 19. Then Jesus answered and said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself, but what he sees the Father do, for whatever he does, the Son does in like manner. The Lord Jesus Christ fulfills completely the Father's will. He's doing nothing of his own initiative, meaning that in what is called the kenosis prescription, God's plan for the Son by taking on human flesh, the word kenosis means he emptied himself in Philippians 2. He did not empty himself of deity. Unfortunately, we sing a hymn, emptied himself of all but love. And you know that amazing love, how can it be? That theology needs to be corrected. He did not empty himself of any attribute of deity. So that, you know, I'd certainly correct that line. And that's a great hymn, but I don't like that line. Emptied himself of all but love. No, he did not give up deity, but he did give up the independent use of his attributes. Understand that. So the idea of him, him emptying himself in the kenosis, he gave up the right to act on his completely on his own initiative. He does what the Father wants him to do. He comes under the Father's will. And healing individuals, even on the Sabbath, teaching the Word of God, he only does what the Father bids him to do, and that's his obedience. So he was obedient unto death, even death on the cross. So he says the Son can do nothing of his own prerogative. He's telling the Jews there in verse 18. He says, amen, amen. He begins by making a statement of affirmation, most assuredly. Now, most translations will have verily, verily. I remember the old King James, verily, verily, truly, truly, I say to you. And only the Gospel of John has the double word, amen, amen. Now I have, it looks like four words here, but actually it's 
the Greek word amen, repeated. We uh, use the English word amen, literally pronunciation in the Greek, amen, amen. And the transliteration is amen, 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 amen. Or truly, truly. Sometimes you'll see verily, verily in the translation. Here, most assuredly. Those are two Greek words repeated. Amen, amen. So that shows you that you, the double use of the word amen or amen, twi used twice, is a strong affirmation. In the entire New Testament, only the Lord Jesus uses amen at the beginning of a sentence as a word of affirmation. Notice, only used by Christ. Amen, amen. Throughout the Gospel of John, the Lord used the word amen doubled in verses 24 and 25. As a matter of fact, that phrase is used 24 times in the Gospel of John. You'll find that double, amen, 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 verily, or most assuredly, 24 times in the Gospel of John. So this is something that Jesus affirms very clearly. I say to you, the Son of Man can do nothing of himself. Meaning that he does not act in independence from the Father's will. He doesn't do anything independent from what the Father wants him to do. And he's the only one that can claim that perfectly. Can you claim that? I've always do, I always do everything the Father wants me to do. <laughs> Let's talk about if you're a child, well, how about your earthly father? Always obey my parents, always obey my mom and dad. Can you, can you make that affirmation? If you're honest, <laughs> the answer is no, that's not always true. Um, but the son, he says, I do everything that the father wants me to do. Every single thing. And therefore, that, I think that shows that he is completely obedient to what God wants him to do. Now, let's take a look at several passages along those lines. Um, John chapter 5, verse 30. John 5, verse 30. I can of my own self do nothing. See, he reaffirms that again. I, of my own self, I can do nothing. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is righteous because I do not seek my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. He came to fulfill the Father's mission or purpose for him. So he acts in complete obedience in accordance with the Father's will. In John chapter 6, verse 38. John 6, 38. For I've come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. I didn't come to do my own will, but the Father's will. In John 8, verse 28. John 8, 28. Then Jesus said to them, when you, see up the, when, you, when you lift up the Son of Man, you shall know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself. But as my Father taught me, I speak these things. I do nothing of myself. John chapter 12, verse 49. John 12, 49. For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me gave me a command, what I should say and what I should speak. He's doing everything according to the will of the Father. In John 14, verse 10. Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak of my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. So completely obedient to the Father's will. So what we call the kenosis prescription, you know, when you prescribe someone a medicine, you give them something that supposedly will benefit them. That may not always be the case, uh, but uh, you have a prescription. Uh, what did the father prescribe the son to do? Obey my will perfectly. What did that include? His dying on the cross certainly would be the ultimate will of the father. Him being the sin offering for the sins of the whole world. He came to finish that work. And here we, we, uh, John speaks about the work of the Lord. Not only healing people but in teaching the word, but ultimately dying on the cross as our substitute. That was the father's mission and purpose for the son. And the book of Hebrews brings that out. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 7. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 7. Then I said, Behold, I come. 
In the volume of the book, it is written to me to do your will, O God. Think about that in the scroll of the book, in the Old Testament. He was called the servant, by the way. Isaiah portrays Christ, the Messiah, as a servant. A servant obeys the master, right? And so, in that sense, it was written in the word of God that the Messiah would come and obey the Father's will. And then in Philippians chapter 2, Philippians chapter 2, verse 7 and 8, but made himself, he thought it not robbery to be equal with God in the sense that having the privileges of deity, now he didn't give up the deity, but the glories of heaven, he let the glories of heaven, took on human nature, that's the idea. He made himself of no reputation, taking on the form of a bond servant. Paul is summarizing prophecy in the Old Testament, the servant Messiah. And we have the servant Messiah uh, uh, chapters in Isaiah. So he took on himself the form of a bond servant and came in the likeness of men and being found in the appearance of a man. Notice he was a man, genuine human being. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death. His obedience took him all the way to the death on the cross, even death on the cross. He remained on the cross so that he could be our sin bearer. As a result of that obedience, we have the exaltation of the Son. He is exalted at the right hand of the Father, and one day every knee will bow to the Son. He will be glorified. God rewards. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, and he will exalt you in due time. And that principle is applied to the Son as well as to born-again believers. We need to humble ourselves in the plan of God and obey his will and purpose for our life. And then he will reward us as believers in Christ. We have the example of Jesus. So Christ was perfectly obedient, perfectly obedient to the Father's plan. Now, so this is a, there was perfect agreement between the Father and the Son in action and purpose. In action and purpose, it was perfect agreement between the Father and the Son. The Son of God receives authority from the Father, obeys him, and executes his will. Jesus would have to be God in order to do this perfectly. So he would have to be God in order to do this perfectly. It was also impossible for the Son to act independently or to set himself against the Father. He could never do that act independent or of his own prerogative in that sense why he was here on earth. He obeyed the Father completely. Now, verse, 30, verse 20. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all things that he himself does. Not only does he obey the Father perfectly, the Father reveals perfectly all things to the Son. So all things are perfectly revealed to the Son. As a father loves a son and shows him all things that he himself does, and he will show him, show him greater works than these, that you may be amazed or marvel. We'll begin with that phrase, a father loves a son. Now, we, we know that the Bible teaches that God loves us. He loved the whole human race. For God so loved the world, John 3, 16, that he gave. But normally we don't think about the father loving the son. Perfect love. By the way, this is interesting because he doesn't use the word agape in this passage. You know the various Greek words for love? We have agape love, uh, the unconditional love of God toward all humankind by sending his son, and the unconditional love the father has for his own children. Nothing will separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord, Romans 8. But here we have the word for fellowship love. Fellowship love. And it shows a unique relationship this, the father had with his son. We even say friendship love, we could call it. The father loves the son. We had the word uh, phileo. You know, Phil, the city of Philadelphia is a city of what? Brotherly love, from two Greek words, right? Philos, Adelphos. Adelphos, brother, right? Phil, Adelphia, brotherly love, two Greek words. So the idea of phileo, the Greek word for friendship love in this passage. Um, the idea of phileo love is to have a special interest in someone or something 
frequently used in the scripture with focus on a close association. So it shows a close association. When you have a friend, you have a close associate. And that's the idea. So the connotation is having affection for, considering someone a friend. Now, let's not misinterpret it. Uh, it wasn't like Jesus was a friend of God in that sense like we normally have friends. It's simply conveying that there is a unique relationship with the Father and the Son. That's the idea. There is a close relationship with the Father and the Son. The Father loves the Son in close association. So the word can connote tenderness, intimacy, the idea of friendship, love, an intimate tenderness. And so the Father loves the Son in that sense, phileo. Now, he indicated that he loved the Son at a few, on a few occasions. Remember at his baptism, he, uh, the voice that came from heaven said this. Let's take a look at Matthew chapter 3, verse 17. Matthew 3, verse 17. Suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, right? Beloved, meaning I love him. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. I'm well pleased. Uh, in the uh, Gospel of John, John chapter 3, verse 35, John 3, verse 35, the Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hands. So John repeats this concept of the Father loving the Son. There is an intimate relationship between the Father and the Son, proving his deity uniquely. Um, and then he reveals things to him. He shows him. The idea of this Greek word is to exhibit something that can be app app uh, apprehended. I think the idea is divine revelation. He reveals all things to the Son. He reveals all things to the Son. Now, of course, this is it referring to his humanity. Certainly, Jesus Christ had omniscient understanding, but in his human nature... He is, the Father reveals everything to him. He shows him all things, all things, meaning all of the Father's plan is revealed to Christ. The Father's plan and purpose and will for his life, it's revealed. And uh, we think about Jesus struggling with this when he prayed in the garden. In his human nature, right? Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Now, he knew, he told his disciples, I'm going to go to Jerusalem, right? I'm going to be crucified. I'm going to rise again the third day. Before his death, five times, by the way, we find in the synoptic gospels, or the gospels, I think all four gospels, we find five times where he predicted his death and resurrection. Over and over, he repeated it. So he knew that that was the Father's will. But in human nature, to face the imputation of the sins of the whole world, to have the Father turn his back on the Son, that weight and plus satanic attack in the garden was upon him. And therefore, he says, nevertheless, not my will, but what? Yours be done. Your purpose, your plan, Father. Let that be done. So that purpose and plan was revealed to the Father, revealed to the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he, he says, as the Father loves the Son and shows him all things that he himself does, he will show him greater works than these meaning that there'll be further miracles that Christ will perform other than healing this man who was lame 38 years. Now, what would be greater miracles than that? Well, one writer put it this way. It would be in chapter 9, the healing of a man born blind. Not only healing a man born lame, but later on in John's gospel, another great miracle, healing a man who was blind. And then chapter 11, raising the dead. Lazarus will come forth from the grave. In that great chapter in John 11, 25, I am the resurrection and the life. Uh, and therefore, he is the one who can give life. So there'll be greater miracles that Christ will perform that you might be amazed, that you might be amazed. These works, by the way, are is a term used of miracles. Greater works means miracles. Miracles It's one of four Greek words for miracle. Four different Greek words are used in the, in the New Testament for a miracle. I'll list those. Ergon is the first one in this passage. Ergon 
We think about the idea of energy. Uh, effort involved is the idea, a deed. So Aragorn has that which is done with focus on the energy or effort involved, an act, deed, or miracle. And then the other three occurrences are in Acts 2.22. Let's take a look at Acts 2.22. The other three words are used in this passage for miracle. So when you see these words, you'll, you'll understand that he's referring to miracles here. Acts 2.22 most of the men of Israel hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, the man attested by God to you by what? Miracles. Secondly, wonders. Thirdly, signs. Now, we don't see the word Aragon in that passage, but those are the four. The one here in verse 20, and then we have the word miracle, wonder, and sign, which God did through him in your midst, as you yourself know. And, and Paul certainly, not Paul, but uh, Peter on the day of Pentecost is affirming that Christ is God. You know, he did all these miracles, these signs and wonders. So these terms are used in Acts 2.22, and they are dunamis, power. We get the word power from that word in the Greek. This emphasizes the mighty power of God as displayed in Christ's miracles. Wonders, teros, is something that astounds something that astounds. It understand, underscores the extraordinary character of the Lord's miracle. So we have a work, we have a power, we have a, uh, something that astounds, teros, a wonder, and then a sign. A sign is a token with a spiritual end and purpose. Remember, sign at Grand Canyon, you know, 10 miles? That's not the Grand Canyon, but it points to where the Grand Canyon is. <laughs> So the sign has a purpose. It's a, just think about a pointer. Christ heals someone. What's the point? <laughs> no pun intended, by the way. What's the point? Well, the point is that he's showing himself to be God. And when Christ performed miracles. Now, others perform miracles show, shows them that, you know, they're speaking on behalf of God. So it points to the message or the messenger. So the signs has a spirit. They have a spiritual purpose and goal in mind. Christ's miracles were to teach us spiritual truths. So the semion is the Greek word there for sign. So we have the word dunamis, ergon, teros, and semion, four words for miracles in the New Testament. And uh, it's from Charles Ryrie. So the father loves the son, shows him all things that he himself does, and will show greater works than these that you might be amazed. Now, the word marvel, be amazed, means to be astonished. Now, it doesn't mean that these Jews will come to faith. They can be astonished at something and not believe. They're like, wow, but yet not believe. It's amazing. So it, the context determines whether their reaction is favorable or unfavorable. You know, He's using these. Hopefully, you'll come to con the conclusion that Jesus is who he claims to be, his deity, uh, but some may not. Either way, they're going to be amazed. You know, I'll give you an example. You might be amazed at a uh, a, a magic person or, or someone who, who does some kind of uh, magician's trick and say, oh, I'm not skeptical how he did that. How did he make that lady float in midair, you know? Well, he has these real thin wires up here, whatever, you know? We might sit there in the audience and be skeptical. We might all say, wow, that looked cool. That was an amazing thing. But then doubt on how that was done. See what I'm saying? You remember when Jesus healed a man who was blind and mute in Acts 12, their conclusion is, wow, he's doing this by satanic power. They came to the wrong conclusion. They came to the wrong conclusion. So he says, I'm going to do these things that you might be amazed, but... Certainly, it will depend upon their reaction to that, whether they believe that Jesus is who he claims to be. Let's stop right there. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word and the certainly the, the deity of Christ that's affirmed in this section. We thank you, Lord, that the Father was in complete obedience to the will, or the Son was in complete obedience to the will of the Father. We thank you, Lord, that we have an example of Christ's 
being obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. And Father, we pray that we might be obedient as believers to your plan for our life, realizing that we do have a purpose, realizing that even through suffering and difficulty, Lord, we can honor and glorify you. And Father, help us to sense that, that you are a God who has purpose and uh, help us to continue to execute your will. In Jesus' name, amen.